Being lost. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The disciples wanted to get noticed. Not at first, of course. At the very beginning, when Jesus first called them, they were pretty content to eke out their living, doing what they had always done before. Collecting taxes, pulling in fish from the sea, being loved by their friends and respected by their peers. But it didn't take them long of following Jesus for their aspirations to start to reach a little bit higher. Throughout those three years of following Jesus on his public ministry, the disciples continually argued about which one of them would be the greatest, about which one of them would be honored when Jesus finally came into his kingdom. They even blasted those who didn't agree with them, called down fire and brimstone from heaven on the cities that rejected them. And they continually shooed away the little children and the people in the crowds who pestered them with less than important things. Despite our Lord's constant call to humility, these disciples routinely wanted to get noticed. Noticed by the people in the towns they visited, noticed amongst each other, and noticed even and especially so by Jesus Christ himself. I guess you could say that people haven't changed very much in all these years. We live in a culture today that seems to be all about the self. In fact, I've come to believe that the number one pastime of most of our young people is taking selfies and documenting everything that they eat, everything that they wear, and everything that they're offended by with pictures on the internet. Whole new technologies have been created around that promotion of the self. And we often gauge our self-esteem by the number of followers that we have, the number of hits our website gets, or the number of likes our picture can garner. But this is nothing new. Long before computer technology joined the party, grandparents were doing the very same thing with the pictures in their purses and stories about how Teddy traveled to Rwanda to bring teddy bears to orphan children, all presented in such a way to garner the most oohs and ahs and praises for having such a great grandson. And our families aren't the only things that we brag about. Think back in history to the outlandish, fin-laden cars of the 1950s, or the sultry, sequined dresses of the 1920s, even the shiny six-shooters of the 1800s gangsters and outlaws were all part of the same pop culture machine, all created and used by people so that some of them could get noticed, that some of them could feel superior to others who didn't have what they had. Even the countercultures that arose up in response to these fads fell into the same trap Hipsters, goths, emos, punks, hippies, bikers, outlaws. They all felt superior because they didn't follow the crowds. And yet, even within their own ranks, there were expectations and there were rules to be followed. And there was always someone who was a bit hipper, cooler, or meaner than the others, and that would get them the attention and the accolades from the others that they desired. In the end, you could say that all of us live on planet, look at me, because we all succumb to those selfish temptations to get noticed for what we do, even those of us who are in the church. Despite the fact that God tells us that he does indeed see everything that goes on, we always feel the need to get noticed for the good things that we do. We want our names on plaques for the things we donate. We want the accolades of our neighbors to acknowledge what good people we are. We even want those who sin against us to recognize and admit how generous we are in forgiving them. So much so that we even have difficulty forgiving them a second time if they sin against us. And if they happen to do it a third time, well then, we'll cut them off. I know you said seven times, Jesus, but fool me once and shame on you. Fool me twice. Well, you know how it goes. We carry those good deeds in our back pocket just in case we need to ever remind someone of just how much they owe us. In case we ever need to remind God of just what good people that we are. 
Yes, even in our dealings with Almighty God, we often haul out our good Christian credit when there is something that we want. We pray and say, God, just give me this one thing and I'll do more good stuff for you. Whatever that happens to be. More prayers, more offerings, more helping your neighbor. We try to bribe God with our good works. Or we expect it because of what good people we are. Just do this one thing for me, God. Don't I deserve it after all the good things that I've done for you? To such a question, our Lord responds with a rhetorical question of his own in today's gospel reading. Jesus says, does the master thank the servant for doing what he was commanded to do? Of course not, Jesus answered. He says, but you, when you have done all that you were commanded to do, simply say that we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Such honest humility and a faithful trust that God sees all the things that we do is unfortunately virtually non-existent among us children of men. Instead, we generally fall into one of two categories. Either we like to paint ourselves as sinless saints, that we're pretty good people, that at least we're not as bad as some of the others out there, believe that hell is only reserved for the Hitlers and the child molesters, that God has to accept us, God has to reward us, because we're not that bad. Or the flip side, sometimes we revel in our sinfulness. We cast God off as if he doesn't matter. We can even go so far away from him that we jokingly may talk about how we know we're headed to hell, that there ain't no saving us, because we know that we're a jerk. We know that we're a violent person. We know that we're a woman not to be messed with. Well, that's not me, you say. Well, ask yourself, do you ever feel slighted because you didn't get noticed for doing the right thing? Did you ever decide not to give another gift because you didn't get a thank you note from the last one you gave? Did you ever excuse sinning against God or your neighbor by saying, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way God made me. Or by listing all of the circumstances that led you to do what you did rather than just own up to it and confess it. Have you ever gotten angry with someone who's called you out on such hypocrisy? Do you ever feel that flicker of shame or doubt well up inside of you before you mash it back down to keep doing what you know you're doing is wrong? Have you ever bargained with God using your good works as some sort of currency? Have you ever excused what you've done wrong in one area because, oh well, I did what was right in this one, so that makes it okay? Did you ever seek out revenge rather than give forgiveness like Christ commands? If you can answer yes to any of those questions and a thousand more just like it, then welcome to the human race. Welcome to the club of unworthy sinners. Welcome to the church, dear friend. This is our clubhouse. For this is the very place that sinners gather together. If you have difficulty forgiving others, then this is the place for you. If you have difficulty forgiving yourself, then this is also the place for you. If you don't really like who you are, beneath all the public posturing, beneath all the people that we pretend to be, if you see within yourself a person that you don't really like, then you happen to be in the right place. If you suspect that your body and your mind and even the whole world out there is lying to you about what life is really like, about what truly and really matters, then welcome to this inner circle. If all your platitudes about what a great person you are or how wonderful your accomplishments are don't really fill your life with meaning and assurance, then you are exactly in the place you should be. If you're wondering what will happen after you die, then you're definitely in the right place. If you're broken and busted up from living in this ridiculous world and you're tired of consuming and collecting stuff for no good reason, if you're worn out from all the self-promotion and self-justification that we do, then welcome to your rest. 
And it is rest. Because Jesus died for you. I know that sounds cliche, right? Like, that's what you're supposed to hear when you come to church, right? But have you ever really stopped to think about what those words really mean? That Almighty God Himself thought enough about your life to redeem it with His very own. And we're not talking about your saintly life here. Jesus didn't look forward and see all the good things that you do and think, well, he's a pretty good person, of course I'll die for him. He didn't say, oh, well, the good things that he does, they sort of outweigh the bad things that he'll add to the world, so I guess he's worth it. I guess I'll die for this one. No. Jesus sees the sin. He catalogs the evil we do. He factors in the doubts, the denials, the rejections. He notes the anger, the betrayal, the sabotage. He sees all the darkness, all the brokenness, all our rebelliousness, and then he says, yep, that's the one that I want. That's the one that I will lay down my life for. And he's talking about you. That's what it really means to say, that Jesus died for you. Faith in a Savior such as this is both the easiest and the hardest thing in the world. It's easy because it's easy to get Christ's gifts. That's because Jesus doesn't give out his gifts piecemeal. He doesn't withhold half of his forgiveness, half of his eternal life, half of his eternal salvation until you've proven yourself to be some sort of worthy investment. No. He gives it all to you all up front, without reservation, without hesitation, without holding anything back. And so faith is easy to get. It starts small in the heart with the question of, can this really be true that Jesus died for me? This is amazing. Hopefully it then grows into the solid Lutheran declaration of, this is most certainly true. Jesus died for me. But then the rest of your life, you will probably struggle with the statement of, this is amazing. Can this really be true? That Jesus died for me? Isn't there more that I have to do? More that I have to change? And that's the hardest part about having faith. Because we will always distrust free gifts. And yet, Christ's salvation is free. And it's free, it'll remain free, and it's complete, and it'll remain complete. God is not threatened by doubts. The righteous will always live by faith, feeble as that faith may be, smaller than a mustard seed as that faith might be. It is still enough because Jesus gives and Jesus does it all. Jesus died for you. So whether you're the self-promoter or the humble servant, whether you're the popular kid at school or the outcast, whether you're the saintly every Sunday churchgoer or the destitute angry sinner, Jesus died for you. Repent and be forgiven. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and live in that grace, in that gift. Not in the hopes that if you do, that Jesus will save you because of what you've done that's good and right. But rather live in the joy of knowing that Jesus already has saved you out of his love for you. Doubts are sure to come. Temptations are sure to come. Despite our best efforts, our sins will continue. And God does indeed see it all. And yet Jesus still forgives Jesus still redeems, and Jesus still saves. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope in this life and the next.